Okay, good evening, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, so I'm the last speaker of the evening, and I will keep it brief. Uh, my name is Andrew Baker, and I'm a professor at the University of Miami's Rosenstiel School. I'm a coral biologist, and I run a genetics lab looking mainly at the effects of climate change on the world's coral reefs. But I'm here to talk about corals and the effects of nutrients on corals. Most of us, when we think of um, nutrients in the Florida Keys and in Dade County, Monroe County, Broward County, one of the first things we tend to think about is water quality and on uh, F uh, Florida's coral reefs, which are in many ways sort of the capstone ecosystem that uh, Jerry sort of uh, pointed out is, is really what sells Florida for, for many of us and the visitors who come here. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, what's ailing Florida's coral reefs and the role of nutrients in that ailment and also the role of nutrients in potentially reversing that ailment and what the real factors are that are contributing to Florida's coral reef decline. And nutrients is a part of that story. This, this uh, I could give a whole class on, on this, but I'm going to keep it brief. This is really going to be very short and a sort of a, a splash course on coral reef ecology. And, um, as many of you know, uh, coral reefs, the sort of the classical picture of coral reefs is one founded upon crystal clear waters with high visibility, high water clarity. And the reason for that is that coral reefs are somewhat of a paradox, actually. They are uh, marine oases in, in a, what is effectively a desert, a very low nutrient environment in which uh, there's an abundance of light, uh, but uh, very little nutrients and uh, relatively warm waters. So in short, coral reefs uh, thrive in shallow, nutrient-poor tropical seas. And the, the, the way in which they're able to do this is that they're somewhat unique in that they form symbioses or partnerships between the coral animal and these tiny single-celled uh, dinoflagellate algae that live inside the coral tissues, which are sometimes called zooxanthellae, a word you may have come across. Um, and the reason why this is so important is these Tiny algal symbionts effectively act as tiny solar panels on the coral surface. They allow the coral to collect sunlight energy, turn that into uh, sugars, and use that to supplement their energy budgets. Essentially, they're feeding off of sunlight. And the reason why this works for them is that there's a very efficient recycling of nutrients between these two partners, the coral host and the algal symbionts. And so that's really key to understanding how coral reefs are able to make a living and, and, and build, um, build the ecosystems in these parts of the world where we typically associate coral reefs with the nutrient-poor, uh, shallow, tropical seas. Now, nutrients are a problem because uh, they can act in two different ways to uh, disrupt the sort of the ecological balance that produces a, a healthy coral reef. They can act um, indirectly by promoting the growth of other organisms on the reef that compete with corals for space. Uh, and I'll talk about that first. Uh, but they also uh, can act directly on the corals themselves, the, the builders of this ecosystem, the ecosystem engineers, the trees in the rainforest, um, and weaken this symbiosis, this partnership between the coral animal and its algal symbiotes. And I'll talk about that second. So first, let's talk about these indirect effects. Um, so we know from a variety of um, uh, studies that were done uh, in the 60s and 70s uh, what the harmful effects of indirect nutrients can be on coral reefs. And, and really some good examples uh, come out of Kaneohe Bay in Hawaii, where due to um, uh, sewage outfalls and sort of poor uh, wastewater treatment, groundwater treatment, uh, the reefs of Kaneohe Bay became smothered in a macroalgae that, that you can see here, a seaweed, a green alga called Dictyosphera. And this alga, because it was fertilized by the addition of nutrients coming from sewage and coming from groundwater, um, grew much faster than the corals. It smothered the corals, um, uh, prevented them from receiving the amount of sunlight that they would ordinarily receive. Um, outcompetes the corals for space. They also act by poisoning directly the corals uh, with secondary chemicals, chemicals that they usually use to prevent herbivory, to prevent themselves from getting eaten. These, these chemicals are sometimes toxic for corals. And they also, uh, we found more recently, promote coral disease and sort of enhance the microbialization of the system. This was sort of a, um, a, a, a became sort of a poster child. Uh, Hawaii did a good job of, first of all, uh, removing the sewage outfalls, and then they reduced the groundwater treatment. And this had a, a, a great role by the 1980s and 90s in essentially restoring the system back to the way it was. And now if you go to Kaneohe Bay, which is actually the site of the Hawaiian Institute of Marine Biology, which you can see there, it's, it's a pretty nice and, and fairly intact uh, coral reef ecosystem again. So nutrient effects can be reversed. And this is just sort of an example. 
Um, I don't want you to get too scientific, but uh, this is sort of a summary of the effects of uh, nutrients on uh, corals. And if you increase the nutrients, you can see that you tend to favor macroalgae, shown by the big arrow going upwards. You also favor bioeroders. These are organisms that munch away at the reef and tend to, to degrade the structure of the reef. Um, you also tend to increase coral diseases, and you actually decrease something called crustos coral algae, which are a type of alga which are actually beneficial for corals. They act as settlement cues for baby corals to come along and recruit to a healthy reef. Um, these other things I've included here, this comes from a, a good review paper, uh, because these things tend to be associated with high levels of nutrients, particulate, organic matter, reduced light, and sedimentation. And I'd also add here uh, other pollutants, other non-nutrient pollutants, as well as pathogens that sometimes are transported along with nutrients from land-based sources of pollution. So um, thinking about this, this phase shift, this, this, this transition that people have documented on some reefs from coral-dominated to algal-dominated, uh, it turns out that certain types of organisms on, on the reef uh, are very important in maintaining this balance. So to a certain degree, you can offset high nutrients by maintaining healthy levels of herbivory. And here are some good examples of uh, herbivorous fish, in this case all parrotfish, that perform very important roles in, in sort of cropping down that algal growth and maintaining space for corals to compete. And of course diadema, which is the long black-spined urchin that was so abundant here and throughout the, the, the Caribbean for much of the 70s and 80s, super abundant, uh, was also a very important grazer in this respect. Unfortunately, we lost diadema due to a mysterious disease in 1983 and 84. And because we had removed this uh, intact and, and lost this intact herbivorous uh, fish population, the, so the theory goes, we lost the ability for these coral reefs to sort of maintain this, this balance. But that's not the full uh, story. Um, I'll skip that one. That's not the full story because there's also, as I mentioned before, direct impacts of high nutrients on corals themselves. Uh, and it involves this partnership again that I mentioned earlier on, this symbiosis between corals and their algae. It turns out that nutrient pollution, we now understand, can actually exacerbate the effects of uh, global climate change. So for example, we found out recently, uh, just with research in my lab, and this is not a great figure um, to explain, but it turns out that uh, corals that are exposed to high nutrients actually end up having very high numbers of these symbiotic algae inside their tissues. These algae thrive on nutrients just like the macroalgae and the seaweeds and they become more abundant in corals that are exposed to nutrients. And it turns out that you can have too much of a good thing. Corals that have lots of symbionts turn out to be very susceptible to something called coral bleaching, which is the stress-mediated uh, 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 response of corals to high temperature. It causes this symbiosis to break down, and I'll, I'll show some photos of that in a minute. So you can have too many symbionts by virtue of having too many, uh, too much nutrients. But also, you can have the wrong kinds of nutrients. Uh, a similar paper that was published recently showed that if you have an imbalanced set of nutrients with, say, too much nitrogen and not enough phosphorus, this also disrupts the symbiosis and results in unhealthy corals that are actually more susceptible to things like coral bleaching and also potentially to diseases. So just, again, sort of a summary of these direct effects on corals. Um, nutrients can harm corals uh, by actually impairing coral reproduction. Fecundity, fertilization, embryo development, and the settlement behavior and metamorphosis of coral larvae actually all decrease under high nutrients. And they also decrease under these other things that accompany high nutrients, particular organic matter, light reduction, sedimentation. And at the same time, other aspects of physiology are also affected directly of the corals themselves, their ability to calcify and build coral skeletons, the thickness of their tissues, which is kind of an indicator of how healthy they are, how fat and chubby they are, and, and uh, able to resist stress. Uh, their densities of their algae, as I mentioned before, um, and so on. So there are, there are other impacts of uh, nutrients on corals that are, that, are, that are deleterious, that are harmful. But is that actually what's killing the corals? Well, Billy, in, who opened this session, uh, uh, sort of alluded to this already. Um, we know that coral reefs are being lost throughout the Florida Keys, and you can read the statistics for yourself uh, down here. But that's really reflective of a, of a regional pattern throughout the Caribbean that we've seen over the last 25 years plus, 35 years now, uh, a decline of, in relative terms, perhaps as high as 80% loss of coral cover on reefs. So for um, every 10 corals that were there before, we're now down to just two. Um, and that's a dramatic decline. So you know, what is causing that decline? And 
in, in order to really understand that, you have to realize that this decline is going on around the world, not just in the Florida Keys and not just in the Caribbean, but even here on the Great Barrier Reef, uh, which is often held up as a, as a case study in excellence in marine ecosystem management. The Australians um, really do the best they can to protect the Great Barrier Reef ecosystem. It's a World Heritage Site. It's very much a part of their national identity. And they fund and protect it um, uh, to a degree that we, we, we simply can't manage in most other parts of the world. And yet, even on the Great Barrier Reef, they're seeing declines of, in relative terms, about 50% over the last 27 years. Um, so what's responsible for all this? Well, as I mentioned before, and as Billy has mentioned before, um, there are larger players. Uh, uh, out there in the world, and, and one of them is climate change, and in particular heat stress caused by global warming. As temperatures rise, it turns out that this symbiosis between the corals and their algae is very sensitive to even just excursions of one or two degrees above the summertime maximum, and that causes this symbiosis to break down. Corals lose their coloration, they turn this ghostly white color, and we've seen episodes of coral reef bleaching become uh, more frequent and more severe over the last 20, 30, 35 years, as a result of climate change and a, a, a result of the slow increase in the maximum summertime temperatures that are being experienced by corals around the world. And at the same time, Billy mentioned this also, uh, this may also, by the way, be also somewhat related to climate change and the increase in temperatures, but we've been seeing over the last 30 years or so increasing numbers of strange, unidentifiable, and in some cases, uh, killer coral diseases, uh, not just in the Florida Keys, but also throughout the Caribbean and also further afield into the Pacific. Here are a few examples. And the real um, worrisome thing about this is that sometimes these diseases sort of interact with coral bleaching uh, to worsen the effect. So here's a, a case of a bleached coral that got hit with a disease called black band disease. Black band disease progresses very rapidly through this sick bleached coral tissue and can turn it into dead coral tissue, we can see here, in a matter of weeks. So disease is very often opportunistic. It takes advantage of a weakened bleached coral and it together those things tend to result in widespread coral mortality. And in fact, uh, this is uh, probably not the bleaching side of things, but diseases were really what were responsible for killing what was one of the major shallow reef builders here in the Florida Keys and throughout the Caribbean, the staghorn and elkhorn corals, which uh, just six, seven years ago were placed on the endangered species list as a result of having been lost more than 97% throughout the entire Caribbean. Um, and that's really mainly due to diseases that, that uh, wiped them out in the 1970s, followed by episodes of bleaching, which just made things worse. So what's the role of nutrients in all this? Well, it's interesting because uh, this is a complex system and there are lots of interactions. Uh, and it turns out, as we found just six months ago, really good evidence showing that chronic nutrient enrichment can exacerbate coral uh, bleaching. So this is just a study showing that uh, if you add uh, nutrients to uh, certain coral species in a field experiment here in Florida, this is done uh, in the Florida Keys National Marine Sanctuary, if you add nutrients to them, you actually see more uh, bleaching prevalence as a result, uh, even six months after you've removed the nutrients. So you have, can have long-lasting impacts. The good news is 10 months after, after that, you lose the effect again. So there's a, a short-term effect of adding nutrients to corals that actually exacerbates their bleaching, as I alluded to earlier. But also, chronic nutrient enrichment also increases the prevalence, the incidence, as well as the severity of diseases. And uh, here's an, an example from a different coral species showing that, uh, again, in <coughs> nutrient-enriched treatments, these green bars, you see higher rates of prevalence, higher disease severity. This effect lasts for at least sort of six months or so, but fortunately it's lost after 10 months or so. So there are interactions which together are causing, contributing to these declines. So I'm going to uh, sum it up here and, and finish here by just uh, summarizing that reversing this decline of Florida's coral reefs, and to a certain degree reefs throughout the Caribbean, is a challenge. How do we get from this, uh, albeit artist's impression of what a pristine reef ecosystem looked like, and we've moved to some degree down this trajectory of decline, how do we get back this way? Can we simply get back this way by removing what we did in the first place, or do we have to come up with novel ways of returning the system to its original state? Well, I think you know, we need to recognize that high nutrient levels can promote the growth of phytoplankton. These are the, the plant plankton that live in the water column, as well as the seaweeds that smother and outcompete corals. They decrease water clarity and can disrupt coral symbioses, which, as I mentioned, are the fundamental building blocks of the reef.
But coral mortality in the Florida Keys and elsewhere is not really directly attributable to nutrients per se. It's not, it's not the nutrients that are killing. Uh, it's really diseases, especially for the acropora, the staghorn and elkhorn corals, and these repeated episodes of coral bleaching that are really responsible for most of the mortality. Uh, however, nutrients exacerbate these impacts, the impacts of disease and the impacts of bleaching, and they make it more difficult for reefs to be resilient, which is this property of a system to be able to bounce back from disturbance, to be elastic, which is exactly what we need in this era which scientists are increasingly starting to call the Anthropocene, the, a geological area that's defined by humankind's uh, impacts on the marine, on the natural environment. And then finally, what should we be doing about it? Well, improving local water quality, you know, improving, removing nutrients and improving uh, the, the state of the, of the water helps maximize the survival of Florida's coral in response to all of these global stresses that we've talked about, bleaching, diseases. Um, and so it's one sort of uh, necessary but not sufficient step in ensuring that we have healthy coral reefs for the future. And I also want to point out that by doing this, uh, which you guys are doing, as, as Billy pointed out, 85 to 95 percent compliant you know, septic tanks and cesspools is a, is a great achievement by 2015. Um, but this will also alleviate the non-nutrient pollutants and the pathogens that accompany this wastewater that would otherwise be entering the reefs, which are also perhaps responsible for many of these disease outbreaks that we've been seeing. So with that, I'll, I'll end it, and I think we've got time for questions. I'll hand it to you, Julie.